back again and uh, we'd like to say happy birthday today to the sun. <laughs> it's, uh, of course, his birthday's not till next Sunday, but this, he, oh, he, excuse me. We need to have his funeral today. He died today. That's what it is. He died today, and uh, this is December the 21st, the day the son died in the ancient world, and, uh, and we can have his funeral tomorrow. <clears throat> All right. We always begin our time together by reading some of our emails, some of our mail. We get a lot of mail from around the world through the internet. The Lord has opened up a lot of opportunities for Grace and Truth Ministries. We are on the internet 24 hours a day all over the world. If you go on our website, graceandtruth.net, you're going to see me teaching 24 hours a day. Plus, we got three, four hundred messages on the archive messages on there, and that's our latest messages, always back, all the way back for about two years. And I hope we get all of the messages on there before it's over with. And we're on TV in about two hundred different towns and cities. The Lord has supplied the way so far, and we hope to continue. And uh, we get emails. We got a an email from Tony Orkin in Tucson, Arizona. Dear Teacher Jim and Mary in Grace and Truth Ministries, I've been studying to show myself approved in the Scriptures. As the Scriptures teach, I've recently run into a dilemma. If I am correct, I thought, you, I, thought I heard you say that Shem is the second born of Noah. In the line, online concordance, Strong's they have listed under Shem, he's the first one. Well, they are wrong. Right. When you go to the 10th chapter, uh, the ninth chapter when Moses and Moses, I got Moses back in the ark again. <laughs> well, he was in a little bitty ark. When Noah comes out of the ark, the Bible says that Noah saw what his youngest son had done concerning Ham. And then you go to the tenth chapter and it speaks of Shem, that Shem would dwell, that it speaks of Japheth will dwell in the tents of Shem and that Shem, that Japheth was the firstborn. Now, I've heard people say that the Bible does not teach that Shem is firstborn. It absolutely does not. The second birth got the blessing. Uh, Cain was firstborn. Abel was secondborn. Shem was secondborn. Japheth was firstborn. Uh, Abraham was was sec, secondborn. Am I getting this right? Jacob is secondborn. Ephraim is secondborn. They received the blessing. Isaac is secondborn. And Shem was second born. I don't care what the online dictionary says. Let me just, if you want to mark this, you mark it. Go, go over, I mean, I'm reading the announcements, but let's just do this. Somebody says this, I want to show you. Now, over here in Genesis, Noah comes out of the ark. And uh, Ham comes up and looks at his father's nakedness. And Noah is drunk. Just because Noah got drunk don't mean we're supposed to drink and get drunk. The Bible teaches that even the patriarchs did some things that were wrong. And you go over there, that ninth chapter, they're coming out of the ark. And it says uh, in verse 24, And Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. So the youngest was Ham, right? And then he cursed Canaan, who was the son of Ham. And the Canaanites would be the servants of Shem. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And God shall enlarge Japheth, and Japheth shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Then when you go to the ninth chapter, verse 21, Unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder. That's it. That's enough said. I'm not going to argue with the online dictionary. They don't know what they're talking about. They think because it says... Chapter 10, you said 9. Chapter 10. Okay, I meant 10. But... Just because the Bible says Shem, Ham, and Japheth, it does not mean that Shem is firstborn. A lot of people think they're named in the lineage, and that's not true. How about Jacob and Esau? They're not land, uh, named in their chronological lineage because Esau is firstborn of the twins. So don't go by that. All right. So, Tony, don't you believe the online 
dictionary. I'm confused as, is he the firstborn, the secondborn? He is absolutely the secondborn. Uh, Shem is secondborn. But he got the blessing like the second birth gets the blessing. Just like Abel got the blessing, secondborn. Just like Jacob got the blessing. Just like Isaac got the blessing. Just like Ephraim got the blessing. And like our second birth gets the blessing. Our first birth is rejected. And I do messages on that. Thanks for your answer in advance. Also many thanks for the DVDs. They're fulfilling and informative. Then Daniel Romaine in Fort Worth, Texas. Hadn't heard from Daniel in a while. He's been calling me the last couple of weeks. Hello, Jim, all at Grace and Truth. This is Daniel down in Fort Worth, Texas, and was wanting to know if I could help out by calling fellow believers across the country that need fellowship or encouragement. God willing, I would like to call him, them and fellowship because I know how hard it is not to have anyone to talk to or fellowship on a regular basis. If you have anyone, please send their name and phone number. And I'll call them ASAP. Agape and Fleo Daniel. I gave him a couple of names last night. Gave him Jeremy Hopkins and I gave him a new fellow over in Oklahoma. Uh, <clears throat> then Donnie writes. He is uh, from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hi, I heard Jim Brown mention agonizing against sin. Well, I'm not the one that said that. Jesus said that in Luke 13, 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. The word is agonism. It's our word agonize. And it's an imperative command. I would really like to hear a message on this subject. I probably got three or four hundred of them. Is there a whole message on it and what message title does he talk about it? I don't know. I've got it in a bunch of them. Then Frank Bishop writes to us in uh, from Australia. I've been going to contact you, but the wheels kind of fell off my cart. I'm being passed through the fire, so to speak. Murphy's Law works well with me. Well, that's, that's if anything's going to go bad, it will, you know. If anything can go wrong, if it will go wrong, and at the worst possible time, to add insults to everything, my computer threw, threw a wobbly on me. I guess a wobbly is an <laughs> Australian thing. The only place I know to take it is, is run by Palestinian people. Well, let the Palestinians fix it. They are nice enough, but I don't feel comfortable with them. Well, they're just as good as Baptists. I mean, what's the difference in an unbeliever? Huh? People got in their heads that Jehovah's Witness and Mormons are worse than Baptists and Pentecostals. No, they're not. They're unbelievers. It's probably just me. It is. If you wait until you find a believer to take an algebra course from him, a guy that believes in predestination, Christmas, pagan, and uh, God doesn't love everybody, you'll probably never take algebra. Unless Mike teaches you. I'm still listening as much as I can to Jim, but really getting a fair bit of flack from my family. Welcome to my world. Uh, the wife, an operation on her left shoulder. It went well, but the arm is stretched a fair bit. Now her neck and right arm are giving her trouble. She says that she believes in God, but flatly refuses to submit to his word. Belief is doing. Saying with your mouth and having a mental assent, I believe in God. Talked to a fellow today. He said, I believe God. And I married this woman, and she divorced me because she didn't ever want to go to church and do anything or talk about the Bible. I said, she don't believe God. Believing, he that doeth truth cometh to the light. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. She won't listen to me when I try to tell her that God demands obedience from those who follow him. He won't, he won't accept second best. To me, she is... Going to learn the hard way. Well, if she ever learns, please, please keep me on your mailing list. Phileo and Agape, the dumb Aussie, <laughs> Frank. Uh, I continue to pray as best I can that God will bless, protect, and provide your needs according to his will. Amen. Thank you, Frank, the Aussie. We love you. And then... Uh, uh, Lampstand Baptist Preaching Station Backcourt. I don't know what that means. This is from Licombo Tico in Southwest Region, Cameroon. Uh, hi, sir. I'm pastor of a small Baptist church in Cameroon. I am writing because I need some tracks for the ministry here. Our church is involved in evangelism. Needs some materials as we do this. Let's send them all they want. Tracks are cheap. Can you be of help to us? Give them lots of these. Give them the Christmas tracks, the predestination tracks, all that stuff. Fix them up a big package. Uh, this guy says, 
You seem to have a great deal of information to share. I'm enjoying your videos. I have only one two-minute video on 70 weeks of Daniel. You might enjoy in the background image on our channel. Further elaborates examples of various interpretations. Please check them out if you have a couple of minutes. I don't believe in various interpretations. I teach you here what I believe is the truth on the 70 weeks, and I know m many of the other theories. I don't believe them at all, and I show why they're wrong. So I don't want you even knowing those. I want you to know the truth. That's the way you can recognize the lie when you hear it. On the rapture, will there be a pre-seven-year rapture? No. And half the virgins we left behind. Oh, good grief. <laughs> also, the tribulation is much longer, and we are already in it. Well, I'm glad you know that. I don't. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, as you said in one of your videos. We are the body of Christ, the anointed one. We will cut off. We will be cut off, raptured at Daniel 9, 26. That's not true. After the 62 weeks... The Jubilee year and plus 10 weeks. That's wrong. The rapture occurs on the sixth seal. That's wrong. Uh, and so forth. I'm not sure why you have an issue with rapture concept. People may say that it was introduced a few hundred years ago, but it is a basic concept interwoven throughout the Bible. It is absolutely not a concept. We're going to be changed at the last trump, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, and you got seven trumpets sound in Revelation 8, 9 and 10 when the seventh one sounds the mystery of God, which is the church, is complete, and Christ puts one fell on the land and all of them see and says time is no more at the signing of the seventh trumpet. And if the last trump, if there's any trumpet sound before the end of time, it's not the last one because we got trumpets sounding at the end of time and Matthew seven, Matthew 24 and 3, the apostles say, Lord, what's, when are these things going to be and what's going to be the sign of thy coming to the end of the world? And he goes through all the signs and then he says, if anyone says, lo, here, there, I'm not appearing in the secret chamber. The next time the world sees me, it'll be as the lightning shines from the east unto the west. And then he says, after the tribulation of those days, the Lord shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. Well, after the tribulation, there's going to be seven trumpet sounds, so the last one hadn't sounded yet. So we're going to be changed at the last trump. Last is the word. Eschatos means the last in a series which no other trumpet will sound. I don't have an issue. The Bible doesn't teach that. That is a terrible doctrine that came to America in the 1830s. About 1836, a man named J.N. Darby brought it to America. He had some little girl named Margaret, Margaret MacDonald stood up in one of his meetings in England and said, Oh, I had a dream. There's going to be a pre-trib rapture, and we're going to go out to meet God. And she's the one that started. 15-year-old girl. Now, that's what we need to listen to a 15-year-old girl, isn't it? Knows nothing about the Bible. While the Lord may choose not to save us or to save us from men, as the example of Cain and Abel, he will save the righteous from his wrath. Oh, good grief. It doesn't matter what men do to us. Fear him that can destroy both soul and body in hell, but don't fear men that can destroy the body. And besides that, God has been whipping his wife with evil men for thousands of years, particularly during the Inquisition, when 60 million Jews and Christians were killed by the Roman Catholic Church. So don't tell me God, God won't let his wife suffer. They already have. All the apostles died because of their testimony. What are you talking about? And then... Uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Evangelist Pascal Lonatio. Greetings to you. I believe you're fine. <laughs> it's funny how they talk. It? I believe you're fine. Instead of, how are you? Well, I'm fine. Thank you for the latest DVDs that I received. Stay blessed. Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord. He is alive. Evangelist Lonatio Pascal in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, then we got uh, Christmas questions worth asking. Here are seven questions asking anyone who claims to be a Christian in America yet is celebrating Christmas. Is Christmas really about Jesus? Why must we constantly be reminded? No, it's not about Jesus at all. Is Christ if Christmas is for kids, so are tricks. They didn't say that. I said that. Y'all did hear that, didn't you? Tricks are for kids. If Christmas is for kids, why are so many adult-oriented items on sale ranging from stereo equipment to booze and pornography? That's a real good question. If retailers depend on Christmas to boost sales and thus the economy, are they much different than ancient pagans who used it to invigorate their communities and bring back the sun? No, there ain't no difference in them at all. It's all about distributing fortunes in the spring, isn't it? If an American Christmas is really about peace on earth, goodwill to men, why is America 
cluster bombing the same kind of people portrayed in their nativity scenes and fomenting war and insurrection in the land of the Magi. Well, that's just Babylon bombing her mother. We're Babylon, they're Babylon. That's our mother over there, and we're going over there bomb, bomb, bombing our mother. <laughs> so you go to blow up your mother this year? Yeah, we go over and bomb her. If people aren't worshiping the Christmas tree, why do they bow their knees to receive its gifts? I've said that so many years. We don't worship the tree. The tree was the giver of all divine gifts to men. They say, we don't bow to the tree, and they go... <laughs> Here's yours, here's yours, you know. I think that's funny, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Um, if people are, oh, we already said that. If we do Christmas different now and do not sacrifice our children in the fire to the pagan false gods, then why are we teaching them materialism and seek after all that is in the world that their souls might be cast in the lake of fire? Is that what is meant by it's for the kids? Yeah. And we're offering our children up to our idols, our cars, our houses, our things, our stuff, our clothes, our rings, our investments. We're telling them, you can have that too. Would you allow your children to befriend an undead 4th century Roman Catholic priest who had a reputation for luring children to his home with toys and candy? I like that because some, some of the historians have said that St. Nicholas was a pedophile. That's why I had all the toys and things around children. If not, why do the majority of Americans teach their children St. Nicholas is still alive and is their friend and will visit their house at night to bring them toys while everyone else is sleeping? Oh, that's from Bradley. That's from Bradley. I think that's funny, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you, Bradley. Appreciate that. And then... Uh, Got a letter from Rick and Denise Young. They're out in Arizona. Tucson, as one guy used to say that I traveled with. Tucson, Tucson. Jim Brown, all at Grace and Truth family. Keep preaching the truth and sending your CDs. Their DVDs. Hope all is well. We are great in Tucson, Agape and Flail, Rick and Denise Young. We love you guys. Y'all, they've been with us quite a while, several years. And then uh, James Larkin writes to us. He's in Staten Island, New York. He's a very generous fellow. And he, and, uh, you know, he sent me a, didn't have a note in it, just a uh, track on election. I'll keep that, use that along the way. Thank you, James. Appreciate your faithfulness and uh, love you, brother. Sharon Marshall, Grand Prairie, Texas, right between Dallas and Fort Worth just outside of Dallas, and she writes us regular, supports the ministry. Hello, Jim, Mary Brown, Grace and Truth family. Could you send DVD 2797, Chosen uh, to Sufferings, uh, your special, I remember that, uh, something series. I have grown so, so through your ministry, learning to die to self. Keep up the good fight of faith. Dying to self from your sister in Christ, Sharon. Sharon, we love you. We, I appreciate your attentiveness and continual watching. Thank you so much. And uh, these words really encourage me. And then we got a letter here from Johnny Kirkman. He calls all the time. He's in Kannapolis, North Carolina, and he sent an offering. And Johnny goes through some hard times, but he's a dear brother. We love you, Johnny. Jim, thanks for keeping the true message going. You'll never know the full impact you're having on people till that one day. Johnny and Jan Kirkman, he's uh, from Kannapolis, North Carolina, and he watches us on the uh, whole bunch of little towns over there we're on. God just opened up so many doors in North Carolina. North, we don't get calls anywhere like we get from North Carolina. Why? I don't have any idea. It, they get more calls than everywhere else put together. It's really strange. We can't figure it out. Uh, well, he don't live in Charlotte. He lives over in Asheville. I think it may be because that's where the Puritans settled years ago, back 300 years ago, and maybe there's a lot of settled people that were taught from that from generation to generation because... North Carolina is completely out of the 
ratio of all the rest of the uh, states. We get more calls from Charlotte and Asheville than we get from Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Beaumont, San Antonio, Austin, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Tucson, Los Angeles, uh, San Diego. We get more from those two towns. It's just, it's amazing. And uh, then we get, we got, a, I'll read a fellow, I talked to this fellow, he, he doesn't know yet. He's going to have to learn. I sent him some tapes, so he sent us a Christmas card. He, he's just trying to show his concern. And he sent us a picture, and he's got Merry Christmas 2011 on it. <laughs> He'll learn when he listens to me. He's a gentle, quiet, talks real quiet. He's been beat down. He doesn't have a car. He's out in... Tucson, he doesn't know what to do, he don't have any money, his father's very wealthy, and his father is a real hard-nosed guy over in Alabama and said, you go out there and get it like I did, I'm not going to help you, and uh, and he's, he said he's, he's going to leave, he said his father's going to leave everything he's got to his stepsister, I'm not going to leave him anything, so, isn't that amazing? He says, thanks so much. For the two gift cards, we very much appreciate the help. God bless. You're truly a man of God. We love you in the name of Jesus. To Jim and Grace and Truth Ministries. From Terry, Sherry, and Ebony Miller. And he's, he doesn't know yet that I, I talked to him about Christmas and predestination. But sometimes the first time around, they think I'm telling them something historically. But... I'm not telling them something to do or not to do, and I am. It takes people sometimes a while to get a hold of it. And uh, that'll be enough reading here. I got a few phone calls. Uh, Phyllis Canty in Washington, D.C. loves the message. Lakeisha Lewis in Beaumont, Texas. She lives on Euclid Street, and I know where that is. And I lived around the corner from there in high school. And Jacqueline Tony in Cincinnati, Ohio, she loves the message and she wants to uh, get our DVDs. That'll be enough, be enough reading. And uh, then uh, I want to emphasize our needy and our poor. Thank you so much for your concern for the needy and the poor. We've got people sitting right in our midst that can't hardly live. If something happens to their car, they're broke down, they can't, they can't get it fixed. And uh, thanks so much for helping us. We had one car donated that we've already given away just recently. And uh, we're trying to help the needy and the downtrodden. We need another car. Uh, right now, let me tell you, we try to help the poor needy believers. Uh, we've got people that are just struggling to stay alive that make from $500 to $1,000 a month. I, I can't imagine that. And uh, that's before taxes. And they're just struggling to live, trying to have food. If something's happened to their car, like I said, they call me and I usually end up helping them get somebody to fix it cheap or something. If you want to send a money, you send a check and put on the bottom of it, for the needy benevolent fund and uh, we'll make sure they get it if you want to send gift cards where they can buy food or gas or uh, at walmart or by visa or mastercard you can pick up a a gift card for 25 or 50 dollars if you don't do that but just once a month or if you did it once every two months you know not doing it now it'd be more than you're doing now and you know how i look at it when somebody comes to me and they say Jim, I'm hurting so bad, and I don't know what to do, and I need $200. And I say, I'm saying to myself, <coughs> if I have it, they need it more than I do here. I'm talking about if they're a regular member of Grace and Truth, and they're really having a hard time, and they're not bums, not young people standing there, sticking their hand out for a free handout. If they're really in need, I, every time I'll say, I can certainly get along with this better than they can. I can get along without it better than they can. And if it's people that are legitimate nearly every time, I'll give them hell. And I don't mean that in a boast. That's from the church, from the ministry. And I, I 
appreciate you trusting me to evaluate these people because I do a lot of evaluating. Once in a while, I'll have some person come along that's young and healthy and strong as a horse and built like a, a bull and say, you know, what about me? I want something free. We're not talking about you. Go get a job. Uh, well, I don't want to work that kind of job. Well, that's too bad. I've worked a lot of those jobs, hauling hay, unloading freight cars, and doing everything you can think of. And uh, I never was without a job over three or four days, even during recessions when I was young. Just get out there and hustle, and you can find something. So help the needy and the poor. And I do need another car, not for me. I, I need another car for a family here in the church. And I'm just putting the word out. Uh, I need a car, something cheap, that's in good shape, that'll get somebody to work on regular. And uh, if you've got, if you got one, you're long distance from here, we'll come get it. We'll fly to get it and come back. Uh, but it's got to be in good shape, and it's for a needy family. So I need one. How cheap is cheap? Huh? How cheap is cheap? Cheap. Five, six, seven hundred dollars. There are, this guy found one that used to come here, and I guess he'll come back one day. I think he went off and found him an unbeliever. But he's a dear brother, I love him. But we put the word out, and he found a car, really nice car, and he was going to give it to his daughter. And she said, I won't drive that big boat. So he sold it for six hundred dollars and this fella gave it to Lily and it was uh what what is that? 96 Buick. 96 Buick and it's like I mean excellent six hundred dollars there's people out there that have them some of them have them for free but I need another one for a needy family that comes here and uh so if you keep your eye out and I need help for this other family I need a cheap car a real cheap one free one if I can get it. It's not for me, it's for a needy family. So, keep your eye peeled, okay? Peel your eye. Ooh, that'd hurt, wouldn't it? <laughs> All right. Turn your cell phones off and we'll get started. Uh, no visitors. I don't see any. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. All right, I'm ready, I think. Mm. Billy Graham had his, had an old Christmas special on today, and they were singing Jingle Bells, and he was young, and they looked silly. Just looks ridiculous. He's sitting in a chair, and he's my grandkids, and he's about 50, 55. It just looked ridiculous. This is Wednesday night, December the 21st, 2011. December the 21st is the winter solstice, the longest nights of the year. This is the night in the ancient world the sun was supposed to die, since it's the longest nights, and was supposed to resurrect three days. That took a full three-day period between the 21st, and the sun was supposed to be more or less in its tomb, and then resurrect on the 25th of December. That's because, I keep saying, and I'm, I'm not finished with this yet. I want you to understand this. This is very important. That the sun is going through, or the earth is going through actually an ecliptic path. And it begins back here in the summer, in the summer, at the summer solstice. And this has to do with the sun going 
of the sun setting still in its position, and it's shining here, and this has to do with the path of the earth around the sun. That's what it has to do with. This is where Christmas comes from. The, the sun, or the earth, is, is, I had to get a little help from uh, my local astronomer out here, John. John took some astronomy in college, and he straightened me out on something. I had been saying that the earth tilted. It doesn't, it doesn't tilt. It's already tilted, and it tilts away from the sun, the earth axis is tilted away and tilts toward in the northern hemisphere. Hemisphere means half of a sphere. Now, when we say hemisphere, this is the axis. Of course, the earth is going round and round like that. It's going round and round like this. When it tilts away in the northern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere is from the equator up, and that would take in the United States, that would take in Europe, all these Scandinavian countries, and most of our civilization began in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, the Greeks are in the nor Northern Hemisphere, and they brought about all the culture and the language and so forth, and the creation of most of your, of your inventions by man were in the Northern Hemisphere. And this is where they celebrated these pagan holidays that began uh, at the, at the uh, autumn equinox, autumn, autumn equinox. Autumn equinox means equal night, E-Q-U-A, -A, equal night. It means there's 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. And as I said in a previous message, before there's 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night, as you're headed towards the winter solstice, which is today, it's the longest nights of the year. Uh, that would be a good title for a song. It's the longest nights of the year. Isn't that a song Andy Williams sang or something like that? Oh, it's the, what is that song? It's the most longest nights of the year. Yeah. All right, now. Then you get to the 21st, and that's the longest nights. The longest days is the summer solstice. Well, this is the earth going around the sun, and it's, the axis is already turned, as our scholar back here says. And uh, he's, he took some astronomy and said it's, it's sitting on the turned axis. So when the earth is the northern hemisphere, when it is leaning toward the sun, then you're in summer. Of course, winter is in the southern hemisphere at that time. And then when it's leaning away from the sun, even though you're closer to the sun when it's leaning away, you're, you're closer, but it's, the earth is leaning away from the sun, therefore, you're in the winter, like so. So it keeps going around, and it goes in an oval shape. I've been doing a little research on this. So they thought that when winter came in the northern hemisphere, they thought that the sun was moving away from the earth, and they didn't know that the earth was on its axis. So the reason for the season, like I've said, is the earth is on its axis. And they believed, and they connected this with, with something up here in the stars, and directly above the earth is Polaris. Oh, that's called the North Star. And the North Star is directly above the Earth. Now, I don't know exactly how that it looks that way as it's going through its... The, the fact is, as the Earth is moving above Polaris, you'll see the, the Big Dipper over here. You'll see it over here in one season. And you'll see it down here in another season. And you'll see it over here in another season. And you'll see it over here in another season. And there's seven stars in the Big Dipper. And, of course, that's where we get the swastika. You get the, what's called the wheel of the year. And the wreath comes out of this. Now, I'm not through with this. The swastika is actually the Big Dipper in its four seasons. And they worship the Big Dipper. 
they said that the Big Dipper was was the wheel of the year. And let's put it like this. Seven stars in the Big Dipper. One, two, three, four, five, six. It kind of curves off at the end like that. And you got the same thing here, down here. So this is, this is summer, winter, or fall, winter, and spring. It's not exactly that way. This, had, this uh, part of the Big Dipper has to rotate. It's like three-dimensional. It rotates because this is actually summer down here. And this is exactly opposite of fall. This is the spring. This is winter. And then the spring is up here. So you have to switch these, switch the Big Dipper in different areas. I'll, I'll have to get together and talk with you about it. I'd really like to have a model of this if anybody wants to help me build one. So as it would go through its path, they would see the Big Dipper in its different phases, and they said this was the wheel of the year, and they had to turn it. So they wanted to get from, from, from summer to fall all the way back around to spring so they could have crops in the spring. Now, this Big Dipper, it, ca it came in many forms. It was called the swastika. And swastika mean it is good. And the Tibetan Buddhist sun worshipers were called svastis, S-V-A-S-T-I. Those were Tibetan Buddhist sun worshipers. And Hitler brought that back from Tibet. Now, I wanted to show you some things on this. It had many names. The British would call it the plow. The plow. And the Celts called it Thor's hammer. They also had another name for it called Philfot, F-Y-L-F-O-T. And it had a number of names. It was called the Gamma Cross, the Gamma, since a Gamma looked like an L, and this looks like four Ls. But it's actually the Big Dipper in its phases. This is where Christmas comes from in the ancient world, whether anybody likes it or not. As the sun as the earth begins to go in its orbit, in its orbit, the, it looks like the sun is waning as it heads over here, leaning away from the sun. It looks like the sun is waning, and it is, but it's because of the position in the stars. Now, Eric, you ought to be able to help me with this. Eric liked to study astronomy coming up through uh, school. In fact, we gave him a telescope one time, and he tore it all to pieces and never put it back together. He liked to do that, see how something worked. Did you ever find out how it worked? Yes, it did bring us killing ants. No, did it? <laughs> oh, oh, you took the you took the deal out and would shine the light on the ants and it would burn them up. Okay, that's a good thing. So when they got to the winter solstice, they thought the sun was burning out over here. So what they did when it was leaning furthest away from the sun, so they had this festival called the Feast of Saturn. Saturn, and this feast of Saturn was just the, Saturn was the father of the gods, father of the gods in Rome. In every one of these societies in the ancient world, all of them began at Babel because the Bible says so, Revelation 17 and 5, says Babylon mothered all idolatry. Well, it's amazing how it permeated all of the culture in the world. It actually has permeated our own advertising. The swastika was said to be, sometimes it was represented in the form of the, what's called the fire wheel, like so. It's just disconnected right here, right here, and right here. And you can get this out of a book that I've got. It's, it's called uh, the Twisted Cross. That's another name for it, was Twisted Cross. And this was the fire wheel. This was just one of the forms. You also had the Maltese cross. That's a form of the fire wheel, the swastika. And when it puts these little points out on the crossbars, that's like it's supposed to come on down or like so, come out like this and come up. They just reduced it down to what they call the Maltese cross. 
In fact, the Maltese Cross, that is the award that Germany gave for their aces in World War I. If they shot down five aircraft, they gave them a Maltese Cross, or they called it an Iron Cross, but it was nothing but a form of the swastika. And they, they had those in World War II, and you see the Iron Cross on the vestments of the American Indian. You see it on all the pagan world. You see actually see swastikas all over the ancient world. That was not originally a bad thing. It was a bad thing in the sense that they were worshiping it, but it got to be called a good luck symbol. Good luck symbol. And that's because if they could just get out of this winter, as they're going into the winter, and get back down here where the earth is leaning toward the sun, and they can have crops in the northern hemisphere, they said that, that it is good. It is good. And that's a Tibetan word, svasti. Svasti. Let me show you. It's not... It became adopted in America, and I've got something here I need to show you. Here is... Um, well, I got it here somewhere. It was in the 20s. In the 1920s, it was the Boy Scout symbol in America, along with the fleur de lis. We got a, uh, the Doyle sent me a, a good year card that one of their grandmothers, one of their grandparents had sent to one of the other grandparents, and it was, uh, and this is what it looked like. This was about 19 and 10. One of them sent it to the other, and I enlarged it, and this is a card. It's a New Year's card, and I just enlarged it. You can see the swastika right in the middle. This is a card that was sold in the United States on a drugstore counter, probably in a little card rack. It had a swastika, and it says, Sent in all sincerity, kindest regards and greetings, gay much joy to the New Year's Day with a swastika on it, in America. And in America in the 1920s, here's the Boy Scout symbol. This was the Boy Scout symbol in the 20s. I'm just simply revealing a lot of this to you right here. It was like so. I'm not a very good artist. Let me see here. That is a fleur de lis. Fleur de lis. That means flower of the lily. Flower of the lily. And the lily, not L I L L Y, L I L Y. And lily, the flower of the lily was, was identified with the Mary of Roman Catholicism. She was called a lily in Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism. And, gosh, I'm not good at drawing, am I? Let me see here. Okay. Huh? Well, I'm not good. You have to quit making fun of me. Now, and then, this is the Boy Scout symbol in 1925 in America. It was a swastika with the fleur de lis or the flower of the lily. That was a Boy Scout symbol. There it's right here. And it's Roman Catholicism. And if you'll notice that uh, New Orleans is a Roman Catholic city. They divided all of their state up into parishes instead of counties. A parish is where you meet in a Roman Catholic church. So you go to such and such a parish instead of a county. On the helmets of the New Orleans Saints is the fleur de lis, isn't it? See, that's Roman Catholic, and they don't even know that, you know, with the great football team they got. They don't know that they're representing Roman Catholicism. This and the swastika is where we get, they say this is the serpent chasing its tail, also along with the earth in its orbit, and it's also 
the sun. They thought the sun was waning, but it was the earth traveling in its path that was bringing them to the winter solstice, so they had to come up, and they had to have this feast of Saturn, and the feast of Saturn was where they appealed to Saturn, the god of the sun. They said he's dying on, on uh, December the 21st. Today the sun is dying. So they had to resurrect him, and they called the sun. They said the sun had to be resurrected every year, and it had to be born again and again and again and again every year, and that's called reincarnation. Reincarnation, or the Jews called it transmigration of the soul. So if you believed in it, then you believed the soul lived on forever, but it would come back in another body, and that entered into their society, this transmigration of the soul. You can look up transmigration in your McLennan and Strong. If you've got a McLennan and Strong, it'll tell you about the transmigration of the soul is the same thing as reincarnation, and that is the sun being born at the winter solstice, and they call that the sun being reborn every year. They called it natalis solis. This is a Latin word, invicti. Invicti means, you can see the word victorious in there. It means unconquerable. And solis is the word sun. Natalis is our word nativity. It means birth. It means birth of the unconquerable sun. That's what it means. That's because it was reborn. And that's where Christmas came into the, the church. It came into the church because Constantine, Constantine was about to lose the empire. He was the... He was the monarch that ruled. Not many of the emperors ruled all the empires of the world. But Constantine ruled the Western Empire at Rome and the Eastern Empire under the Byzantine Empire at Constantinople. They built a, he built a capital there. And that's where the Greek Orthodox Church comes from in Russia. It's the same thing as Roman Catholicism. You see those guys with those big, tall, black hats and the beards, and that's the Greek Orthodox. They do the Mass and all the rest of it. But Constantine in Rome, in the boot of Italy over here, was ruling over here, western and eastern. But you had above, the, above Turkey or above Constantinople, uh, call it Istanbul now. Istanbul's not Constantinople now, it's Istanbul. In case you hadn't heard that. The Four Lads, 1957, when I was in high school. All right. Then up in the northern hemisphere up here, above, above... Yugoslavia, or what used to be Yugoslavia and Bulgaria, and that's Herzegovina and the states over here, these Balkan states. Above there, you've got what was the key to the American worship of the Christ Mass. Up above here, I need a map for this. I've been trying to get some people to give me one. I go, and the fellow's going to try to get one. But you get up into the Scandinavian countries, and that is where we get most of our Christmas stuff. Because the Scandinavians came down into the, Nor the Normans and the Saxons came into England, conquering England, and brought their Druidic worship with them. Norman comes from the word north. It means north men. That's what the Normans were. Whenever you see a Robin Hood show or you see a, uh, you see a Robin Hood, he's a Saxon fighting the Normans and they're the ruling class and he's over there trying to get... Prince John, the sheriff of Nottingham, and he's, he's a Saxon, and they're Normans. Well, the Normans were the same thing as the Vikings. And among the Vikings of the Scandinavian countries, that's Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. That's above this up here. Up in those areas, they worshiped the sun in the form of Woden. Woden was the father of the gods. Woden was the same thing as Zeus... In Greek, Jupiter in Rome, and the same thing as Saturn in Rome, the father of the gods. They had many fathers of the gods. They had many variations of the gods, and it was the Saturnalia that they celebrated for seven days from the 17th to the 24th. All these gods, in, in every, every culture, they had many of these gods. 
and they all had to do with the swastika. They had to do with some form of it. The wreath was called Wheel of the Year, and it is a variation of the swastika. Let me show you something real quick here. It's a variation of the swastika. That's all it is. Every one of the pagan writers, all of the historians will tell you it was the swastika. Actually, what you should do at Christmas time is put a, is put a swastika on your door and see what kind of attention you get, okay? Just do that. Let me show you something. Every, everybody's always handing me stuff, and uh, I appreciate that. Here's an average... You have all kinds of Celtic... When you say Celt, immediately think Druids. Druid, the Druidic worship was the Celtic worship, and it was... The Druidic worship was fire worship, they would go down to a beach and they would do what Israel did except they didn't actually kill people. They did when they were back into antiquity but it got to be a, a ritual. They would go to a beach, they would start a bonfire and they would, uh, they would take an oat cake and they would take all these pieces of oat cake and put them in a basket or a hat and they'd take one piece of the oat cake and blacken it. And then they'd all draw out, and whoever got the black piece of oat cake, they had to jump through the fire. You remember when Israel passed their children through the fire? They actually killed their children and ate them. Well, this is a custom of the heathen. And we get the term black ball from this. When you black ball someone, if you're in the Masonic Lodge, which is a form of the mysteries of the Mediterranean religions, you blackball somebody, you put in a vote against them coming in. In fact, I got some things to say about the Masons tonight. <coughs> this comes out of a book that somebody got in the mail or something, advertisement, and uh, it's to sell Celtic coats for nice pretty women there and Celtic ornaments that you can hang up in your house. There's a Celtic god. It looks like uh, it's Serenunas, and it's one of the gods. It looks like Neptune or something, and they got all these other jewelry and stuff. And on the front of this, it has, it has a little wreath, and it's got eight spokes in it, and it says in the advertisement, Wheel of the Year, said to somebody's house. The Celts, and that's the first words in it, see it has crept into our society, even our advertising, and people don't even know when they see this that they're, I'm not saying somebody's doing something evil to buy that wheel of the year or buy that coat. I'm just saying it has crept in, it's become so ho-hum, second nature, we don't think anything about it. It says the Celts did not measure the passing of time with a calendar their sense of the year was the circular marked at the quarters and cross quarters for the seasonal festivals. They're giving you the truth in this advertisement. It's really funny. The beautiful detailed plaque by Maxine Miller depicts the cycles of nature in plant forms arrayed around the spokes, eight of them. There's eight. The Roman Catholic Eucharist has eight spokes in it, and the swastika has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight festivals, one on each point of the swastika, and then when you have your, I've got a book up here, the Roman Catholic Eucharist, to show you that this is all Roman Catholicism, I got it up here somewhere, I can't see it, but uh, where is my Roman Catholic book, does anybody see it? I don't see it, it's up here, but I'll find it somewhere. But it has a Eucharist, and it's got the eight spokes in it. And by the way, when you're studying in McClinic and Strong encyclopedias, it will tell you that in the ancient world, when they, were, they would drive chariots, now chariot didn't mean just a war thing with two wheels. A chariot was a wagon of any kind, and they always had, in the peacetime, they had eight spoked wheels. These were peels, wheels of peace in their peace chariots. They had six spokes on their war chariot, their two-wheeled chariots. Don't want to go into that because that's the eyes of the Lord, isn't it? So it says, wood finished, it says, Maxine Miller depicts the cycles of nature. The cycles of nature is the earth going through its 
cycle here. And this is Celtic, Druidic. And Druidic is, is sowing right here on this point of the swastika, right here. And this was all sun and tree worship. That's what Christmas is. I don't expect people to understand all this. And here's Samhain right here. And that's what the Roman Catholics brought in the Catholic Church and called All Hallows Eve. Or we call it Halloween. And it was the night of the dead coming back and walking. And we comforted them and fed them food. And then it says, uh, Wood finished resin plaque has eight hangers on the back. So you can turn it as the year turns. As the year turns, you can turn this. Keep up with the seasons. Now let me give you something else. I've had this some time. I got this somewhere. I don't know if it came in the mail for me. One time, I subscribed to a Roman Catholic magazine. Because, I mean, one of these sales magazines that sells you all kinds of, of uh, scapulars and little medals and stuff. I want to see what they were doing. Well, in... Roman Catholicism, they brought one of the Celtic goddesses into the church. Her name was Brid. Brid. And Brid, we get the word Bridget. And that was a Celtic goddess. Celtic goddess. And she was called Queen of Heaven. And we know that God reprimanded Israel in Jeremiah 44 condemned Israel for worshiping the queen of heaven. That's 600 years before Jesus is born. 600 years B.C. 600 years B.C. And in Jeremiah, the seventh chapter, and the queen of heaven was Mileta, one of the female tree deities, and actually all of them, Aphrodite. Aphrodite means wrath subduer. That means Aphrodite could subdue the wrath of her son, who was the son of the sun god. So it means... A wrath subduer, and that's what a female mediator or a mediatrix, and that's what Mileta was, and that's the Mary of Roman Catholicism. They say you pray to Mary so you can subdue the wrath of Jesus, and it's not Jesus that has the wrath, it's the Father. He is our mediator. So, Bridget was brought into the Roman Catholic Church. Anybody that's been a Catholic has heard of St. Bridget. Any ex Roman Catholics here? You remember St. Bridget? That's where she comes from. She was a Celtic goddess, queen of heaven. But it's amazing. They had another form of the swastika. And what is it the swastika does? It is the traveling of the earth. It's the, it's the, it's the movement through the four seasons of the, of the Big Dipper so they can have crops over here in the spring. It's all about food. And God says, you want to get through these long, hard winters? I'm your God. I'll fill up your storehouses if you worship me. If you don't, I'll empty them. He's the fertility God. So when you find Bridget is brought into the Roman Catholic Church and renamed St. Bridget, she was also called Queen of Heaven, and we actually get the name Britain from that. It is in Britain that the Celts grew to the strongest, and that was brought out of the Scandinavian countries or the what's called the Anglo countries. That's where they have these white, blonde-headed, blue-eyed people, Viking types, you know, and that's what Hitler was looking for. And he was a squat little squirt with a little goofy mustache and he looked nothing like an Aryan race, did he? I, I don't know why the German people never did get a hold of that. He didn't look Aryan. He looked like a clown, looked like Charlie Chaplin, you know. So, and they had... Brid, they had Brids, they had Brids, Brid being the goddess, Brid, from that we get Bridget, Brid. We had her form of the swastika. Swastika is about the earth going through its path, and it's about food coming in the, in the summer, in the spring and summer. Her form of the swastika was called the Brid's Cross, and it was like so. It's like this. I wish I was a good artist. I could depict this all much better. But it was like stalks of wheat. Well, that is about food, isn't it? And then it would have, it would have like small sheaves coming up. And these are stems. 
and then it would have these buds of wheat out here on the end of it, like so, and you'd have it out here like this, and this was called a bridge cross. Had, these were stems of wheat, and you had the buds out here on the end of it, like so. This is called the bridge cross. It was another form of swastika. And people say, what are you, a Nazi? Oh, good grief. No, you're the Nazi if you're doing Christmas. I'm not. I'm telling you what it's about, that you shouldn't be doing it. Adolf Hitler was a sun and tree worshiper. You might get this kind of a lecture in some college if a man was teaching on paganism in the ancient world, but he probably wouldn't get this deep. Now, here's a picture of the Bridge Cross right here. And you've got it everywhere. You've got it all kinds of books. This is out of a witch's book. Witches are not women who ride around on brooms with hooked noses and warts all over their faces. A witch is a nature worshiper. Ask any of them. You meet one of them, say, what do you do believe? We believe in worshiping trees and nature and the sun and, the, and embracing, the, uh, embracing the world. And, and uh, they don't believe in flying around on brooms. That was implemented into this more current paganism in the last few hundred years. A witch in the Old Testament, when God says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, that is the word kasaf. Kasaf. And kasaf means to whisper or enchant or to make somebody feel good. That's talking about Billy Graham. That's talking about Kenneth Copeland. They're witches. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. You'd have to go around killing all these preachers, wouldn't you? So let me read this to you. In myth, Brid, Irish, Scottish. Ireland is a Roman Catholic country. That's why they're at war all the time with the English because they do not want the Church of England forced upon them. And you have the IRA or the Irish Republican Army that's always at war and they're bombing and blowing each other up. To live in Ireland is a pretty difficult thing because you've got constant war between the British, between the English and the Irish and you have to cross the channel over there to get over to Ireland and they're always at war. You've got all kinds of movies and it shows somebody's a member of the IRA or the Irish Republican Army. It's all about war between Catholics and Protestants. That's what it's about. You see some movie, every once in a while you see some, I saw some movie a while back and it was one of the famous stars and he was a member of the IRA and he was trying to plant some bombs and all of this. That's what it's about. It's about Catholics, Catholics opposing uh, Protestants. Let me read this. Bridget, Brigitte, Brid, Bride, Brigheed, her name comes from the old Irish Brig, meaning power. Her Gaulish name is Brig Brigindo and she is probably the source of the Anglo goddess Brigantia and Britannia. And Britain gets their word name from Britannia. She was, Britain is named after a Celtic tree goddess associated with the sun god of the ancient world. I've got all kinds of books on the Celts. That's what Christmas is about. In the pagan world, you had, especially the Scandinavian countries, they worship Woden as the father of the gods, and Thor was his son. Woden and Thor. Woden and Thor. This is Christmas. Same thing. We get our, our word Woden's day, or Wednesday, from Woden. And Woden flew across the sky on a great white horse, and he had... His hair, he had on his head, he had his hair down like that. And I got a picture of that. Hitler gets his hairstyle from Woden, and we get St. Nicholas flying across the sky in a sleigh pulled by reindeer. We get that's closely associated with this because even in that ancient world, they even had reindeer carrying some of the gods across the sky in a sleigh. So actually, Hitler and Santa Claus are related. You might not know that. Let me read this. She was the great mother goddess of Ireland. This is Brig, Bridget. At one time in history, most of Ireland was united in praise and worship of her. She probably was one and the same with Dana, the first great mother goddess of the Irish. Brid, perhaps, the 
supernal mother fertility and creative inspiration, she has also been worshipped as a warrioress, protectress, healer, guardian of children. There you are. That's the same thing as a patron saint of children. That's the same as St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas was a 4th century Roman Catholic bishop from Myra, there in what we call Turkey, they called it Asia Minor. A slayer of serpents, a sovereign, a goddess of fire and sun. Still other sources say she was the goddess of agriculture, a fertility god. Animal husbandry, medicine, crafting, and music. She was credited with inventing the Irish morning whale called Coine or Keening, when she mourned for her son, Rudan, her child by her husband, Bress, who was killed in battle, part of her essence is still said to reside in the Binsade, the fairy spirit. There's demons. It is among the Celts that we think of fairies, isn't it? And a fairy is a demon, is a genie. They're all the same thing. If you believe in one, you have to believe in the other. Whose keening can be heard at night before a death. I think of the harpies as the as the, the harpies were supposed to be female demons as the Greeks were going through the Aegean Sea and the harpies would be crying out and screaming out and if you got too close to the harpies, they were demons that would devour you. I, whenever you hear these loud sirens, they called them sirens also. That's where we get our word sirene. I had a girl who used to uh, write us when I was doing some TV out of Charlotte, North Carolina and she wrote a letter one time and she's a simple young girl. She said, I just love to hear you sing these songs. It gives me such a siren feeling. <laughs> she meant serene. In the 5th century, her shrine was killed there. I don't guess this doctor. Was desecrated and adopted as a holy site by Christian missionaries who turned her into St. Bridget. They latched onto her sky goddess aspect and nicknamed her the Queen of Heaven who was supposed to be turning this Wheel of the year or the wreath or the swastika was actually the Big Dipper as the earth went through its, its phase here. They believed that this was, they worshipped all this. They, they did worship the sun, moon, and stars, didn't they? When you go to Babylon, when you found the Magi coming and seeing the star in heaven, you had two sets of Magi. Magi means wise men. And they were the Magi or the Magos from Babylon. And some of these were evidently descendants of Abraham because they had some righteous men over there. So when they studied the stars and they saw Christ's star in the heavens, they came over here to worship him. But it probably took months because he was two years old by the time he got there living in a house. So Jesus was born of a virgin. He died to save sinners. But the swastika don't have anything to do with him. And the swastika is the tilt of the earth axis as it goes through its path. Let me show you something else. And uh, they go into Imbog. In fact, the fact that she was a war goddess, that equates with she was called goddess of fortresses in Babylon or Minerva in Rome, and Minerva was the goddess that conquered all other gods. But let me show you something else. Uh, what I, did I show you that? Oh, the magazine. Wait a minute, here it is. They're advertising through here. Catholic co company, San Dom Domino Crucifix. You can go through, through here and you can start off. You can buy your crucifixes, your rosary. And you get here to the fourth page. It's got right here. Advertising, St. Brid, St. Brigide Bronze Cross. Originally made of straw. That's exactly true. It's not just straw. It's the wheat during the year where you where you uh, harvest the crops. You can look at that and see it. It's St. Brigid's, Brigid's Cross. But you can read the advertising and they reveal what they're doing. St. Bridget Bronze Cross. Originally made of straw, the St. Bridget Cross is commonly hung over the doorway and believed to protect the household and invoke the blessing of Ireland's most important female saint. How about... The ancient Celtics, most, one of the most important female deities. This special cross was handmade in Ireland at Wild Goose Studio, County Cork, by skilled craft workers and finished in bronze. And it started 
in the ancient world. And actually the Celts came down from the Scandinavian world. And in the Scandinavian world, they worshiped Thor, the son of the gods. And Thor's hammer was a form of the swastika. Thor's hammer, he was said to conquer all the other gods, and this has to do with Christmas. And Thor's hammer was a was an was emphasized swastika. It had the 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 arms breaking slightly, but it was a swastika, and that was called Thor's hammer, and he conquered all the other gods with this. And Thor was the god of thunder and lightning. And the lightning is represented in the Scandinavian world by the runes, R-U-N-E. The runes are the lightning bolts. And those were worn on the collars of Hitler's SS. They even called this SS. But it's actually lightning bolts. And that was Hitler's death squad. You didn't cross the SS. You could be a lieutenant in the SS and you could override a general that was in the Nazi army and you could have him, you could have him executed if you were just a lieutenant. No one questioned the SS. The SS was like the, like the uh, FBI. <laughs> it was kind of like the IRS. You don't question the IRS. They come and execute you. That's just all there is to it. No one, they answered no one. So you've got the cross here. Now let me give you some more things on this. I, this is, in this book, you've got the, uh, you've got the, uh, the wheel of the year here. There's the swastika. It'll tell you that it's about harvesting, planting, growing, and fallow. And you've got the different seasons, autumn, spring, Beltane, Samhain, and you got all of the uh, winter, winter, summer, spring, autumn, and then you got the eight festivals on here. You have at the top, let me go ahead and put these up here again, so in case you might want to write them down. This, this is nothing but the earth. They took all this and made this great pagan culture out of it, invented Christmas, invented Halloween, invented Mardi Gras, invented Easter, and brought it into the church through Constantine when he's ruling the Eastern and Western Empire. He thought he was going to lose the empire to all of these hordes of barbarians. So he said, I will bring their gods into the church. I'll amalgamate the two, and when I do that, then we will have a peaceful world. Well, he didn't calm... How do you calm down a bunch of wild people? He got him calm for a while, but he brought the Feast of Saturn into the church, which was equivalent to Samhain. They were all the same. They were all the same. They were just sun festivals. You had, up here you had Mabon. That was right. That was, then you had Samhain, S-A-M-H-A-I-N. And that is Halloween. Then you had Yule down here. They're all the same. They're just the earth, a different place in the orbit. That's all it is. Eight festivals. This is nothing but the, but the Big Dipper or the Big Bear or the Plow or any number of names they had for it. They had dozens and dozens of names for it among the pagans. Then you had Beltane down here. Beltane comes from the word Baal, B-A-A-L. So drive you that midsummer here, midsummer. Then you had Imbog. Ostera, which is our Easter. And if you notice, the cold months were the ones they emphasized because the northern hemisphere in the cold months, that's where all this civilization actually began. And they had some of these festivals among the Incas down here in the southern hemisphere, but most of them were up here in the northern hemisphere where all civilization began. Because civilization began in Sumar, which is southern Mesopotamia, and that's in the northern hemisphere. So you end up with all these gods in Turkey and among all of the, uh, the old Soviets, uh, the old Russian 
uh, Siberia and up here in Scandinavia, and you, it, they end up out here in England and Ireland, and that's the Celts, that's the Druids, and they come in many different forms. And in Rome, you had the Sat Feast of Saturn, and you had you had among the Celts, some of them migrated over here to France. They came to all these different areas with their version of sun and tree worship, and Israel's version of sun and tree worship was Baal, Grove, Moloch, Shemosh, Ashtaroth, the gods of the Zidonians, the gods of the Amorites, the gods of the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and all these gods, the gods of Egypt. It matters not where you go, whether it's Amun-Ra of Egypt or whether it's Osiris of Egypt. These are virgin-born sons, and the mothers are, are virgins, and the sun deities like Ra, that are, those are sun deities of of Egypt, you got sun deities in Greek, that Greece, that was Jupiter. That's what scared me. As I would study these Greek and these Greek and uh, Roman sun gods and, and tree goddesses, I got to studying that, and for years, from the time I was about 17 till I was hitting 40, I was studying Old Testament Israel. And I kept seeing, they kept going after Baal and Grove and Molech and Shemosh. And I'd look up and see Astaroth with the tree deities. And I'd look at Jeremiah 10 and it says, They cut a tree out of the forest, they deck it with silver and gold, they fasten with hammers that it moved not, they put it on a platform, they put gold and silver on it. And Mr. Layard says, Because they deified these gods and the stars, they put a star on the top. This is what Layard says they did. He said they made a tree. They put it on a platform. Jeremiah 10 says they decorated silver and gold. And Layard says they put a star on top. If that's not a tree, I'll eat my hat. I don't even have a hat. But I'll find one and eat it. If that's not the Christmas tree. Now, let me give you something else on this. It's just, I've got so much information. I'm trying to document this each year. I want you to see all this. This is... Wait a minute, I missed one of the festivals there. Is that Lugnosh? I believe it's Lugnosh, Lugnasada, or however you pronounce it. It's a very difficult word. I'm sure these witches can, L U G H, Lug, N A S A D H, Nasada, S A D H. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you have the you have the Eucharist with eight. It's divided into eight sections on the Roman Catholic Eucharist. And this all comes out of Roman Catholicism. Now, I'm going to. My father one time told me, after he heard me preaching on Christmas a bunch, he walked into my den and he said, Jimmy, I've always known Christmas was pagan. I couldn't figure it out why he knew it. And he said, he was a 33rd degree Mason, or 32nd degree Mason, and he said, you know a lot about the Masonic Lodge. I said, I know that. That's because I owned A Morals and Dogma by James Pike. They're supposed, the women are supposed to give these books back to the Masonic Lodge if their husband is a Mason and he dies, but they don't ever do it, most of them don't. And you can run it because they don't want you knowing the secrets of masonry. It's filled with what I've been putting on the board. Packed full, every page. That's why my father said, I've known Christmas is pagan for a long time. I remember when I was a little boy in Fort Worth, eight, nine years old, he'd tell mama, I'm going down to the Blue Lodge. It was a Blue Lodge on Main Street, uh, Fort Worth. I know right where it is. And I would drive by there, and Daddy said, there's the lodge. And he'd sing in the lodge and, and sing for the Masons, and then he was one of them. That's why he knew that Christmas was pagan. I'm going to read some out of my... Some of it won't exactly make sense. I want you to hear the sentences out of this Masonic book. Some of it I can explain. He got so crazy with it that he got to put so many names in it. But let me give you this. this. It starts in chapter 2 here. Let me see if i got something in chapter 1. This is the man who organized masonry in America 
His name is James Pike. Here's a picture of him. And this is Morals and Dogma. And they hate it that I'm going to show you this in public because this is a mystery in all the mystery religion. In Greece, they had the Dionysiac Mysteries. D I O N Y S I A C, I believe it is. D I O N Y S I A C. These were called the mystery religions, and you had to be initiated to go into them. Everything the Masons have comes out of these mystery religions, and, mas and Masonry is about the mystery religions. Oh, they'll put things about God and Solomon, and, but when you're in the Masons, you can believe in any God you want to believe in. Your doorknob on your house can be your God and be your deity as long as you live moral lives. But how can a man do that outside of Jesus Christ and outside of a new birth? He can't. When I was in real estate, every once in a while, I'd have a guy come in and give me the Masonic handshake. He overrides yours with his thumb. And that means if you will cooperate with me, I'll give you business, not only mine, but all the business I can bring to you if you reciprocate with a Masonic handshake. I knew what it was. And they'll go, waiting for you. And I never reciprocated. They would disappear out of my office and they were gone. One time I was traveling. I traveled in music. I traveled with a lot of people. My father was a very brazen sort of fellow, to say the least. Brassy. The most brassy man I ever knew in my life. And I used to read everything I could read. Just, I love biography and biographical sketches. Well, I read about five biographies on wider. I'm still right in the middle of one right now. Read Billy the Kid's biography. Read uh, Eric Hartman's biography. He was the top German ace in World War II. And I read Robert Johnson. He flew the P-51 in World War II. Read his biography. Just read Washington's biography, a lot of others. And I got to reading about this sheriff in Tennessee. His name was Buford Pusser. I was talking about him. They hadn't made this movie yet about him. I kept talking to my dad, and I found out that Roger Mudd had made a documentary on sheriffs on counties where it's dry on one side of the county and wet on the other side. Well, the most interesting man that they made a documentary on was Buford Pusser. He was the walking tall sheriff. I kept telling my dad about it. My dad said, he needs a manager. And just like that, you know, real brassy. He picked up the phone, dialed uh, information, dialed Adamsville, Tennessee, asked for the Pusser residence, called it, and Buford answered the phone. He said, you need a manager. He said, I need to come down and meet you. Well, we went down in a meeting. And I was in the room. And Buford was about six foot seven, weighed about 270 Five pounds, big as a house and fast as a cat. He was a bad dude. He's very questionable, a lot of his actions. I was there, I know. And we got to traveling with him. My father started borrowing money on his houses, on his house and renting uh, auditoriums around the country. And I would travel with Buford and we'd travel together. And, and he'd say, what did he do? Well, he got Bing Crosby Productions to send a bunch of film clips to him, and I'm bringing out the Mason part of this. This is very important. He got this, uh, this Bing Crosby production to produce the movie. And my group would go out and we'd sing a show and then I'd sing the walking tall theme on the end of it. And then Buford would come out and then we had film, he had film clips and he was real hot at that time in 1970, 72, 73. And, uh, so we started, this, that's how I met Mary, was through lawsuits with his estate. And that's an old, long story, and I'm not, not interested in, in pursuing anything along that line. But anyway, we started appearing with him. I appeared in uh, Fort Worth at Will Rogers Auditorium with him. And uh, Buford was my age, and we had daughters the same age. Duana was the same age as my daughter, Debbie. And... Uh, and so we, it was easy for us to talk. We were in high school at the same time, different states. And I picked him up one time out at the airport. He said some things to me that go completely against the movies. He even said, 
I didn't blow up any steels. He said, that was Hollywood production. He said, I never did that. He said, I was having, he said, I didn't go to not kick some doors down. Uh, he said, I didn't do that because I was uh, in the hospital having 24 operations on my face. And it blew his, when he got shot by that bunch, that ambush team, blew his chin completely off. And I asked him one time, I said, you get cold at night? And he said, you see how my teeth are all metal? And he said, they get real cold. Anyway. Buford got to breaching contracts. And one weekend, my dad and I went down to Adamsville, went to his house, and what's funny is he slept in the basement of his parents' home, and I slept in the basement of my parents' home. And we went downstairs, and he's laying across the bed, and we talked to him a little bit, and we said, we'll see you in Adamsville, Tennessee, Adamsville Georgia. He said, okay. So he, was, he said, we'll see you in Adamsville. Well, he didn't show up that night, and... And there was a big hullabaloo because the JCs had put on the show in the high school, and we were appearing, and we did the music part. He come out and did the did the slide show and had people asking things about department and under the table things that's going on behind the scenes. Well, they arrested me and my father for theft by deception. Said we didn't even know Buford. Well, they took us down to the jail. When they took us to the jail they wouldn't put us in jail. And I said, Sheriff, can I use your phone? I need to call Miss Pusser. He said, yeah, you go ahead. So I called Miss Pusser in Adamsville, and I said, Buford's supposed to be appearing with me here right now in, in uh, Douglasville, Georgia. She said, well, everybody wants Buford. I said, Miss Pusser, you don't understand. He's supposed to be here right now. And my father was walking down the hallway with the sheriff, who was a 32nd degree Mason. My father was a 32nd degree Mason. And they were saying, brother this, brother that, brother this. They wouldn't put us in jail. Buford had breached the contract. The point I was getting at, masonry will let you off the hook. They will rescue you if you are an axe murderer. I, I had a Mason, a black fellow that was a Mason, come here and Johnny said if you ever see a man standing with his feet like that at, a, at an angle about like 35 40 degrees about 45 degrees and standing with his thumbs in his pocket he's a mason in trouble and he'll be recon he'll be recognized and rescued by another mason I've seen my father do that many times many times what I'm getting at masonry is built on good works they will help each other. They don't care what the offense is. And that sheriff was not going to lock my father up in, or lock me up because my father was a Mason and they were brothers. And they will stick together to the death, regardless who's right or wrong. And you're off the hook. Isn't that right? Yep, it's a, yes, sir. But let me read something to you out of this masonry book. It's about fire worship and tree worship. Every one of these gods taught doing unto others as you have them do unto you, being a good person without repentance and without a new birth. I'm just going to read some sentences in it to let you see. In the first chapter, the point within the circle represents God in the center of the universe. It is a common Egyptian sign for the sun and Osiris. This is out of a Masonic book. And it's still used as astronomical sign of the great luminary. In the Kabbalah, the point is Yod, the creative energy of God. By the way, another form of the swastika is, let me ever put it up here, is the yin and the yang, the yin and the yang is like so. There's dark here, light here. This is a form of swastika because there's light here, dark here. And by the way, you know what this is right here? Yin yang. Huh? Yin and yang. That's a yod in the Hebrew language. That's the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And he speaks of being the yod, the creative energy of God. And the yod has much great... Uh, the Yod means the hand in 
the Hebrew language. Let me read the rest of this. Read some more. Some writers have imagined that the parallel lines represent the tropics of Cancer and Cap Capricorn when the sun alternately touches upon the summer and the winter solstices. This is on page 17. Let me read some more over here. The popular theology taking the multitude of allegories and symbols for realities degenerated into worship of celestial luminaries, star worship, Jupiter, Venus, of imaginary deities with human feelings, passions, appetites, and lusts of idle stones, animals, reptiles. The onion was sacred to Egyptians because its different layers were a symbol of the concentric heavenly spheres. It's like the onion. You see what I'm saying? The onion is layers of concentric spheres. Masonry, successor of the mysteries. He even tells you this is the successor of the mystery religions which worship sun and tree worship. That's Christ mass. Though masonry is identical with the ancient mysteries, it is so only in this qualified sense. You have to be initiated into masonry just like you had to be initiated into the mysteries, just like you have to be initiated into the Mormon church. By the way, the Mormons have the same rituals as the Masons. Joseph Smith had to have copied masonry. He has the slitting of the belly. If you reveal the secrets, the Masons have the same thing. They wear the same apron. They go through all the same rituals, and we have men that have converted out of all of that. And when they get together and compare notes, it's all the same. Though masonry is identical with ancient mysteries, it is so only in qualified sense that it, rep that it presents but an imperfect image of their brilliancy. It's talking about the brilliancy of the stars, of the warming and the heating, the light and the dark. Masonry also added, listen, it said, sometimes when you're reading, you've got to read what it's saying, read between the lines. In the monastery, there is a fraternity and equality, but no liberty. Masonry added that also and claimed for man a threefold heritage, liberty, equality, fraternity. You know where that comes from? That comes from the French, a Roman Catholic country, and they were screaming this as they stormed the Bastille when they overthrew the aristocrats, those like, uh, like uh, Mary, Marie Antoinette when she, somebody, somebody told her, said, well, they, the, the peasants have no bread. She said, let them eat cake. And they were screaming, liberty, equality, fraternity, while they were attacking the Bastille where they were keeping all of the poor, while they were overthrowing them in the French Revolution. And by the way, our revolution was patterned after the French Revolution by Thomas Jefferson. His mentors were the French philosophers. So you can kind of read into that. Let me read some more of this over here. He's talking about what the Masons should do. They should be, it is good to enjoy the blessings of fortune. How about distributing fortunes, the word demon? Listen to this. You cannot say the great teacher, not God, not Jesus, but the great teacher served God and mammon. When the thirst for wealth becomes generally, it will be sought for as well as dishonestly as honestly. He's saying when you're honest, you can seek for wealth. That goes against the Bible, doesn't it? Let me read some more stuff here. All right. It gets pretty, it gets heavier. This is a lot of things you may not recognize, but just listen. The word karum, K-H-A-R-U-R-U-M, and kurum, K-H-U-R-U-M, is a compound one. Jacinius renders, Jacinius is a Hebrew historian. You have Jacinius lexicon. Karum, by the word noble or freeborn, K-H-U-R, kur, meaning white or noble. Scandinavians, Anglo-Saxons. It also means the opening of a window, the socket of the eye. Kuri, K-H-R-I, also means white or opening. And Chris, the orb 
of the Son. In Job 8 and 13 and 10 and 7. That is Chris or Krishna is the Hindu sun god. Now he's got this all through here. Krishna and Har means the sun and Krish means God. So Krishna, Hari Krishna is the sun god of the Hindus. It's all the same thing. I talked to a Hindu one day and he said, we believe in being good and doing right by people. He called me from New York and he said, it's a lot like your Protestants. He said, we just believe in doing good and doing the best we can. But they do it all in the name of Krishna or Brahma or Shiva or Vishnu. And these are all sun and tree goddesses. And by the way, Sati, is it Sati? One of them sits upon a lily pad on the top of a turtle. A lily, flower of the lily. All this is intermixed. It's how corrupt we are. Krishna is the Hindu sun god, Kur, K-H-U-R. The Parsi word is the literal name of the sun. From Kur, K-U-R, or K-H-U-R, the sun becomes Korah, a name of lower Egypt. Lower Egypt was called the sun. The sun, Bryant says in his mythology, Christmas is sun worship. I'm going to keep reminding you. You say, what? what? What is all this hurting us? The Bible says the custom of the heathen are vain. And beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. And we're not to be keeping any of these rituals. God says, I don't even want you to know how they're doing it. The son, Bryant says in his mythology, was Kur, K-U-R. And Plutarch says that the Persians called the son Kuras or Kurios, and Kurios is the word Lord in the Greek. That's what they call their son, Lord. In Greek, like Adonai, Lord in Phoenician and Hebrew was applied to the sun. Many places were sacred to the sun, called Kura, Kuria, Kuropolis, Korin, Kuroskata, Koresta, and Koresia in Scythia. The Egyptian deity called by the Greeks Horus, H-O-R-U-S, was Her Ra, or Her Horus, Hor, or Har the Sun. This thing gets outrageously detailed, really not making a whole lot of sense. He's just identifying who they are. And he goes on to say, Ario, Ares, Air, Ar, Aramon, Aramonius, the R meaning fire or flame. There you are, back to the bale fires or the bonfires in the, in the middle of winter, helping the sun to get warmed up. They said, we'll help the sun warm up. It's burning out, and the earth is going through its path. And they're saying the sun's burning out. We've got to start fires on the earth, bale fires or bonfires. Help warm the earth up so the sun won't die. Let's give it a birthday, December the 25th. This sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? If people hadn't heard this before, they'd say, what in the world is that guy talking about? Won't they? Hermes, or Harmus, Har, meaning sun, Hermes was the interpreter of the gods, the same thing as Mercury in Rome. And when Paul stood up and spoke with great eloquence in the 13th chapter of Acts at Lystra, they said, he is Mercury, the interpreter of the gods. And this other man, Barnabas, is Jupiter. He said, don't you call me those gods? They said since Paul was such a great orator, he had to be Hermes or Mercury, the interpreter of the gods. The Hermes was Cadmos, the divine light or wisdom. Movers says it is Mar, the sun. In the Hebrew, Aor is light, fire, and the sun. Cyrus said Setius was the name from Kuros, the sun, Kuris, and he goes on and on. Let me read something down here. We know through a practice testimony in the ancient annals of Zur, T-S-U-R, that the principal festivity of Malkarth, M-A-L-K-A-R-T-H, the incarnation of the sun at the winter solstice. We're talking about the same thing that I've been talking about the bell in the grove, the birthday being at the winter solstice. You can, and this is a Masonic book. 
That's why my father knew that Christmas was pagan. I said, why didn't you tell me? Because that was one of the greatest disappointments when I found out they had lied to me about Santa Claus. When I was a little kid, I suspected it was wrong, but I thought, I kept thinking, why would they lie to me? As a little kid, I was so objectively honest, I couldn't understand them lying. He goes on here and he says, this, talking about this winter solstice, held at sewer, was called his rebirth or his awakening. That's the birth of the unconquerable sun, December the 25th. All of these sun gods' birthday was December the 25th because that's when the sun died on December the 21st. Tonight, the sun is dying. It's going to resurrect tomorrow. That it was celebrated by means of a pyre. Then a pyre is where you burn fire. It was celebrated by a pyre, P-Y-R-E. The pyre is where you put bodies on and burn them up so they'll go off and be with the sun somewhere in heaven. And those were bale fires so that they could heat up the earth and help the sun not to die out. And on this pyre on which the God was supposed to regain through the aid of fire, new life, bale fires. This festival was celebrated in the month Peritus or Berith, the second day of which corresponded to the 25th of December. These facts we learn from Josephus, Servius. These are the historians that they... Even this mason is bringing this out. Servius on the Enid, the Dionysiacs of Nonus, and though a coincidence that cannot be fortuitous, the same day was at Rome, the Dis Natalis Solus Invicti, the birth of the unconquerable son. This is the same thing they're describing in Egypt that was at Rome, and he's describing it in a Masonic book, The Morals and Dogma of the Masons. That's why my father knew it was pagan. That's why I don't think he really got serious about whether we celebrated or not. We were poor. He didn't have money. We didn't have much, but there could have been some kind if he actually believed it was okay. And when I preached on it and he heard me the first time, he said, well, I've always known that, Jimmy. I thought, well, then why were you trying to do it? Even though we went for years not able to do it. The festival day of the invincible sun under this title, Hercules, or Heracles, different spelling, was worshipped at Zur. Heracles in Egypt was worshipped the same thing as Hercules in the other cultures. Was worshipped at Sur. Thus, while the sun was being erected, the death and resurrection of the sun god was annually represented at Sur by Solomon's ally at the winter solstice by the peer of Malkarth at Surian Heracles. Boy, this thing goes on and on. It talks about the sun and its rays, and it says down here on the bottom of this next page, so in Arabic, harem, an unused mint, was high, made God, made great, exalted, and harem means an ox, the symbol of the sun in Taurus at the vernal equinox. I didn't make this stuff up. They've got a section in here on what Masons believe. I might read some of that. Let me see here. Ah... Uh, there's so much here. All antiquity solved the enigma of the existence of evil by the supposing the existence of the principle of evil of demons, fallen angels, a Raman, a Typhon, which is the serpent god, a Siva, a Loki, or a Satan that first falling themselves plunge into misery and darkness. And he says, Krishna, or let me read this other. In a mediator, a redeemer, by whom the evil principle to be overcome and the supreme deity reconciled to his creatures, the belief was general that he was be born of a virgin. This is among the pagans. He had to be born of a virgin, suffer a painful death. The Indians called him Krishna. The Chinese, Kuntze. The Persians, Sosiak. The Chaldeans, Donavani. The Egyptians, Ho'ori. Plato, Love. And Scandinavians called him Balder. Krishna, the Hindu redeemer, was cradled and educated among shepherds. A tyrant at the time of his birth ordered all the male children to be slain. He performed miracles, say legends, 
the male children to be slain. This has all happened with Jesus and Herod, didn't it? He performed miracles, say his legends, even raising the dead. Krishna did all of this. He washed the feet of the Brahmins and was meek and lowly of spirit. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? With no new birth, no resurrection. He was born of a virgin, descended to hell, rose again. Jesus didn't go into hell. Ascended to heaven, charged his disciples to teach his doctrines and give them the gift of miracles. The first Masonic legislator whose memory is preserved to us by history was Buddha. And he was the sun god who was born out of his mother's left armpit, the fifth ray of the sun god. You get that out of, out of your McClinican Strong. I mean, this is insanity, folks. And Christmas comes out of all of this. Listen to this. I'm reading out of Morals and Dogma by James Pike. The, he's not James, Albert Pike, excuse me. I hope not. Mary's, a, Mary's that's Mary's maiden name, Pike. Maybe you're just kin to Pike's Peak. Maybe Pike's Peak is your first cousin or something. Yeah, Albert Pike, excuse me. James Pike was that crazy preacher that said God is dead in the, in the 1960s or something like that. All right. The cross has been a sacred symbol from the earliest antiquity. Remember the Maltese cross? It comes in many forms. It comes in the Lohengrin cross, many, many variables. It is also the swastika or the, the wheel of the year or the wreath or the Big Dipper or the plow or any number of other names. It is found also, the cross is found in the enduring monuments of the world in Egypt, in Assyria, the Hindustan, Hindustan, in Persia, on the Buddhist towers of Ireland. You know what the cross stands for, don't you? It's the Tau. It stands for Tammuz. It was also the worship of fertility in the form of the Ankh. Here's the Ankh right here. The ankh. This is the ankh. This is the womb. This is the entrance to the room. Womb, entrance. And these are the ovaries. And the ankh was called the flowering tree. That's because it was the woman's womb. It was sex worship is what it was. It was fertility worship. Uh... I don't know how to explain this. There's no explanation. Just read it and say, think about it. Christmas comes out of all of this trash. Jesus was God in the flesh. He died to save sinners. Christ's mass doesn't have anything to do with him. Christ's mass has to do with the swastika and Adolf Hitler and, and the worship of the Big Dipper and, the, and all of this and Thor's hammer and all of this garbage. I'm reading it to you. I don't know how to document it. I can't repeat this. Well, it's not any different than Adolf Hitler. It's not any different than his mentor, Madame Blavatsky, and I've got her books up here, The Secret Doctrine. Secret is the same thing as mystery. And she has researched this tremendously. She lived in a tenement house in New York City in 1910, went back to Germany, and, he fought, and Hitler followed her. You got swastikas all through here. Or forms of them, or Thor's hammer. Buddha was said to have died upon a cross. The Druids cut an oak into a shape and held it sacred and built their temples in that form, pointing to the four quarters of the world. That's what they're saying it points to. North, south, west, <coughs> east. See? That's what, it's to, that's what they're talking about. According to the four quarters of the world, it was a symbol of universal nature. Nature is what witches call themselves. They are nature worshipers. And it's, then nature has to do with the, the path of the earth so you can have crops. That's nature, isn't it? What is natural? It was on a cuneiform tree that Krishna was said to have expired, pierced with arrows, and Jesus was pierced with a Roman spear. And that was a thousand years before Jesus. Why do you think God let them do this? 
so he could confuse the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction so he could send them strong delusion that they would believe a lie. You know how many people have called me and told me, well, they had these saviors in the ancient world and they had disciples and they died on a cross and they were pierced through with spears and arrows and they rose from the dead in their mythology. What's the difference between them and Jesus? Jesus is God and they're not. He actually rose and they didn't. And God let him think that through one of the descendants of Cain when Cain's mother Eve said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. That's where the false virgin birth started. There's a true virgin birth and that's of Christ. And he was born of a virgin in Bethlehem in a manger, but Christ's mass doesn't have anything to do with him. Christ's mass is Roman Catholicism. The Masons, Roman Catholics, the Klan, the Klan wore tall white pointed hats, white sheets and worshipped a flaming cross on that lady day in the ancient world. That's why they burned crosses in people's yards. I've thought that they'd burn one in my yard for preaching things like this before it's over with. If they did, I'd probably get some, call the local newspaper and go out and get me some marshmallows and be roasting them with a the reporter got there. Pointing to the four quarters of the earth. It, and the priest of Baal wore tall white pointed hats, white sheets, and worshipped the flaming cross, and so did the and so do the Roman Catholics, and the, so does the Klan, and they all come out of the same thing. All of that's the same stuff. And they worship the sun god and the moon goddess among the Muslims. So Muslims, the Klan, Christmas, Easter, Mardi Gras, uh, Halloween, Masons, they all come out of the same thing. They're all found at the same place. Druids cut an oak. Well, let me see. I read that. But its pe peculiar meaning in this degree is that given to it by the ancient Egyptians, Thoth, you remember we talked about Thoth a couple of weeks ago, one of the sun gods or one of the water goddesses of Egypt, when God struck the waters and, and caused it to bleed and said, I'll strike your gods. Thoth was one of the Egyptian sun gods or water gods. Thoth or Phathah is represented on the oldest monuments carrying in his hand the crux on Sada or the cross or the Ankh, a tau cross with a ring or circle over it. Now people will say, well, Alexander Hislop's Two Babylons, he says this in his Two Babylons. It's in the Masonic books. It's in the McClinic and Strong. It's everywhere. You can verify Mr. Hislop that he's true by looking at all of these other books, all these other historical accounts. Mr. Layard, Layard's Nineveh. He did all of his excavations in 1849. He printed a Layard's Nineveh. And you can buy Layard's Nineveh where it says that all these goddesses were worshipped in the form of a cone, a cone, and that they, since they were deified in the stars, they put a star on top. You get the cone part out of McClinic and Strong. You'll get the star part out of, out of Layard's Nineveh. He's one of the most famous of the ancient historians back in the 1800s. Do I have any time? I don't even know how to get to all this. The cross was a sign of creative wisdom or logos, the Son of God. Plato says he expressed him upon the universe in the figure of the letter X. Well, X is a CH in the Greek. And when Constantine said he saw a cross in the sky, Lactanius, his son's tutor, said Lactanius was one of the most brilliant scholars in, in the fourth century. And since Constantine is the root of the world, he can hire anybody in the world. He wants to be his son's tutor. And Constantine said he saw an X, or he actually saw a key, and then he added the Greek R, that's the CHR, that's called the Labrum of Constantine. That's on all the Roman Catholic vestments. The Thoth or Phthah is represented as the oldest monument carrying in his hand the crux ansata or the Ankh. The cross was the sign of creative wisdom or Logos, the Son of God. Plato says he expressed him upon the universe in the figure of the letter X. And Plato was not a Christian. We're not talking about that guy out of Rebel Without a Cause. The next power to the supreme God was 
decussated or figured in the shape of a cross on the universe. Mithras signed his soldiers on the forehead with the sign of the cross. And you get in and then you get into the CHR, the Labyrinth of Constantine. If you'll notice the Masons have got a swastika down here. Sometimes they put the CHR by putting it like this. I, like I've said, I don't know how to give you all this information other than to show it to you. Here's the R. That's an R in the Greek. And they'd make it like this. They would make this, it, sometimes they'd make it this way. You can see the CHRs. Here's a CHR. Here's a swastika and some forms of the swastika and so forth. Let me read this. We constantly see the tau, the resh, united thus. The resh is the Greek R. There are two letters in the old Samaritan as found in Arius. Stand the first for 400, the second for 200 equals 600. This is the staff of Osiris. Also, it is monogram. It was adopted. Look up monogram in your McClinic and Strong. You won't believe what you come across. I've done that. The Egyptians used the sign of their god. Canobus was a cross or a Maltese cross indifferently, any way they want to use it. Gosh, you know how much there is in this? I've just marked some of it. Back here where they say, let me read you what Masons believe. No man truly obeys the Masonic law who merely tolerates those whose religious opinions are opposed to his own. They're saying you need more than tolerance. They say you need tolerance, but you need more than that. Every man's opinions are his own private property. There is no prophecy of Scripture of any private interpretation. Private is the word idios. It means self. There is no prophecy of Scripture in Second Peter there. First chapter of any private interpretation. And the rights of all men to maintain each of his own are perfectly equal. You have a right to obtain your own opinion and keep it. No, you don't. Not in the truth you don't. Merely to tolerate, to bear with an opposing opinion is to assume it to be heretical and assert the right to persecute if we would and claim our toleration of it as a merit. The Mason's Creed goes further than that. And here's part of their beginning of their creed. No man it holds has any right in any way to interfere with the religious belief of another. Are you kidding me? If anyone brings any other doctrine, do not bid them Godspeed. Rebuke them. And if they repent, then forgive them. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses that are contrary to the doctrines you've learned and stay away from them and avoid them. Avoid them. Don't go down to a Masonic lodge and gather together with them and hold hands with them. Not if you're a believer. If you're an unbeliever, that's okay. Because you're going to hell anyway. It holds that each man is absolutely sovereign as to his own belief. I'm sorry, God is sovereign. And that belief is a matter absolutely foreign to all who do not entertain the same belief. And that if there were any right of persecution at all, it would in all cases be a mutual right because one party has the same right as the other to sit as judge in his own case. In other words, if somebody condemns you, you have a right to condemn them. We're kept, supposed to keep our mouth shut as a lamb to slaughter his sheep before his shoes dummy open not his mouth. And God is the only magistrate can, that can rightfully decide between them. To that great judge, Mason refers the matter and opening wide its portals, it invites to enter there and live in peace and harmony the Protestant, the Catholic, the Jew, the Muslim. When you come in, you're all brothers. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says get away from them. If someone brings another doctrine, do not bid them Godspeed. Don't gather with them. Don't get in a house with them. Do not be cheerful to them. Do not be gracious to them. Yet Masons say Protestants, Catholics, Jews, Muslims are supposed to all gather together into one little happy bear hug. Every man who will lead a truly virtuous and moral life Love his brethren no matter what denomination or what his belief is. You can't love your brethren because love is a God, and that's walking in Jehovah God's commandments, isn't it? Not in Muslim commandments. And minister to the sick and distressed. They're going to try to get to heaven by their works. 
I wonder if my father thought he was going to get to heaven by his works. He used to say the only thing he wanted after his death was a Masonic funeral. He was insisting on it. And believe in the one. They just got the one. Not God, but the one God you want to believe in. Your chair at your table in your kitchen. Your doorknob is your chair. Your lamp is your God. They don't care. As long as you believe in a God that dictates to you to do good to one another. That's sun worship. That's let us make us a name, isn't it? All powerful. It don't matter. The one. All powerful. All wise. Everywhere present. God. Architect. Creator. The preserver of all things. If you're a Muslim, it is Allah. If you're a Jew, it's Jehovah without Jesus. If you're a fire worshiper, it's Hercules or Jupiter. They don't care what it is. Just name it and you can have it. It's kind of like AAs, isn't it? You can name your own God. Just don't talk about your convictions. By whose universal law of harmony over ever rolls in this universe. How about universal law of political correctness, tolerance? That's what Catholicism was founded on. When, when Constantine issued his Edict of Toleration, the great vast infinite circle of successive of death and life, the circle of death and life, the earth going through its path, the great vast infinite circle of successive death and life, to whose ineffable name let all true Masons pay profoundest homage. We may well be tolerant of each other's creed. The Bible has no tolerance. God, there was no tolerance in Israel. You worship none of the God, you died. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And believe me, Allah and Jehovah are not the same. Did you know a lot of young black men were seduced into that during that black movement in the 60s, thinking that Allah was the same? They were seduced in the black Muslim movement, thinking that Allah and Jehovah was the same, and it's not. For in every faith, in every faith, they're talking about pagans or whatever, Muslims, Baptists, Catholics. In every faith, there are excellent moral precepts. They're talking about getting to heaven on their morals. Far in the south of Asia, Zoroaster taught this doctrine. Zoroaster was one of the chief sun god teachers of the Persian world. That sounds like Billy Graham, too. Sounds like Billy Graham, yeah. He embraced, do you know he embraces Muslims? He embraces Catholics. He embraces Buddhists. He says, I love them all. On commencing, well, by the way, he is, a, he is a Mason. That's why he embraces him. On commencing a journey, the faithful should turn his thoughts toward Armuz, which is one of the sun gods of the Egyptians, and confess him in purity of his heart to be king of the world. He should love him and do him homage and serve him. He must be upright, charitable, Despise the pleasures of the body. That's what uh, one of the doctrines of the devil. And he goes into demons of darkness. And I've just kind of picked through the front of this book. This has the Saturnalia, Mother Night, which was Christmas Eve in the ancient world long before Jesus. This is a Masonic book. The Masons and Christmas and the clan and Easter, Ishtar, Mardi Gras, uh, Muslims, Halloween, Valentine's, they're all Catholicism, and that all comes out of pagan sun and tree worship. That's amazing. You can look around at used bookstores and sometimes at garage sales and you'll find somebody selling one of these. They're worth getting a hold of them. It's got so much in here. It's just nothing but sun and tree worship from one end to the other along with their form of their morality and their ethics. And if you shake hands just right with them, they'll do business with you. And they'll pull you out of any situation you're in. Just shows you how corrupt America is. They told me I wouldn't run any hits in this town unless I joined the Masonic Lodge. Yeah, well, you have to be a Mason. If you want to get somewhere in business... You join the lodge. They all do business That's with right. each other. They're just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees had something called a kabura, C-H-A-B-U-R-A. And the kabura was, a, was like a group of people. It was like a lodge. And they only traded and sold and bought with each other. They made sure they had the money flowing. 
in their little circle. I, there's so much to this. I had this year, I thought, I can't do this without reading it to you. I couldn't remember all this. It, and I couldn't remember it in the detail it's in. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. Lord, I'm ready to teach these things to the world. Lord, I pray that you'll give us strength and courage, cause the people to be willing to support this ministry. The more we advance financially, we'll go on more TV. We'll try to get out there and tell the world these truths about Christ's Mass and Ishtar and the Masons and, the, and all the rest of it, Lord all this foolishness that they call Christ's mass. Lord, you want us to, to live in your word, not this drivel and trash that they've come up with, sun and tree worship, and try to give it a respectable position in our society. Thank you for your word. Crush us under your hand. Cause us to be willing to preach this truth to the world. Lead us to your elect. Strengthen the flock. Thank you so much for what you've done so far for us and what you're going to do in the future. We'll give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you want to come up here and look at my some of my stuff, you can. My family was all in it. My I didn't brother know was, was in it. My mother was in it. And she asked me, she says, well, how'd you get that book? She says, you probably ain't got a real one. What are you so doing? Yeah. I love you. I love you, too. <laughs> I love you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it, Mike. Better than you deserve? Yeah, I know what you mean. It's the only way we get anything done. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. Hey, John. Well, you know. You bring that note I had up on here? That little note about the earth being open? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Yeah, that's what, that's what John was telling me. It was an oval. Went through an oval pattern. Hey, you guys, come up here and see Papa. Christopher, come here. Christopher, come here and see me. Come and see Papa. Oh, I love you. I love you, too. You love me, too? You do? Why? Because I'm, cause I'm Papa? Say, yes, sir, Papa Jim. You love me? I love you, too. You ought to go home with me tonight. Where are those things, Tanner? Huh? Where are those things, Tanner? What, these? Mm -hmm. That's a menorah. Can you see menorah? Menorah. See you later. Menorah. See, who is this? Chrissy. Who is that? Chrissy. What does he call you? Chrissy. 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 What are you doing? I told two